here. I want to officially thank them again for coming, taking time from being downstairs to take part in this. Um, yeah. So, what's it like all these years later, after starting out um, the early days of uh, the horror and the video boom, being a filmmaker and being actresses in it, People coming up to you today and, and uh, thanking you for being in these movies and the appreciation. What's it feel like, you know? And for the work you're doing now, as well. You're looking at me, you're looking at me, Michelle. It's amazing, and I can't believe it. I have to always pinch myself and think, "Oh my gosh, is this really still happening?" <laughs> and I can't thank everyone enough. I've had people coming up to me. This whole weekend saying, oh, I've been a fan of you since 1980 or 90. And it's like, and thank you so much for being that fan and keeping this all alive. It's an unreal ride. And if it wasn't for all of you being so faithful, it wouldn't be. And I just, from the bottom of my heart, want to thank each and every one of you for all the years of Yeah. Michelle and I were at the very first one at Farley Dickinson University 25 years ago, and here we are back, and a lot of you were there too. People have come up to the table with photos of when we were all kids, <laughs> and before we all grew up, but I think that we're a community, and that's what makes it so interesting. It's, you know, everybody that comes up to my table, I know them, and I see them periodically, and it, it keeps us all young, I think, to be a part of fandom like this. Fred, what are your thoughts on this? When people come up you know, to you and comment on your early films, and, and these ladies were a bit of them? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised as, as well. And you know, as we're starting to do uh, Blu-ray restorations of some of these films, uh, we're, we're doing documentaries where some of the actors are coming back 20, 30 years later. And of course, the one thing everybody talks about <clears throat> is that at the time that we made these films, they were considered to be disposable product. I mean, they weren't meant to last. They were meant to you know, fill a, a gap in somebody's release schedule you know, for the month of August or something. And the idea was, like drive-in movies, that they would you know, go out there and they'd sell a couple thousand units and they'd fill a Halloween slot on somebody's schedule for a VHS release. There was no thought that they would ever last any longer than that. You know, and then to see them, okay, now they're on Laserdisc 10 years later, then they're on DVD, and then they're on Blu-ray. And um, it's, yeah, and it surprises everybody involved in these films that, that there's still an interest in what was basically considered to be a disposable product at the time, that there's, a, that there's still an interest in them. And when you watch them, you know, when I would see them, like they showed um, Hollywood Chainsaw at the New Beverly as part of the film festival. If you watch it, you kind of can see that it's a product of its time. You know, it's a product of 1987. And, and to me, sometimes some of the humor doesn't work today. But it, was, it seemed funnier to me in 1987. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it still has legs. You know, it still has legs, and I think the Evil Tunes and Scalps and the rest of these things still find an audience today. And, and yeah, I think it's, it surprises me. Um, I actually forgot, I told him yesterday, I forgot to bring, I had the laser disc for Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers. I'm open. <laughs> yeah, I still kept it in the plastic, like, one day it's going to be worth millions. And I was like, oh, I have everybody sign it, but I forgot. Aww. But it's millions of yen. And yen, yeah. Uh, well, pesos and pesos. <laughs> um, 
ask a question. Uh, I always thought when I when I watch these films um, that you directed and you ladies appeared in, it was interesting. It was uh, either sci-fi or horror and sexy, but also your films also had a, like a tongue-in-cheek thing. A lot of the times, not all the time, but it kind of worked. Where a little comedy, the, the, the sexiness, and whether it was a horror theme or a sci-fi theme, it kind of touched all the bases. It was that something that when you made the film, keeping in mind the distribution, like you're you're, you're playing a, a B feature, or a, what were the thoughts when you? It wasn't like a straight horror film or straight sci-fi film. I just want to say, from my own experience working with Fred, we're on Be Beverly Hills map, and we have Eddie Deason, and he has his hands on my girly bits. And then Fred just spontaneously, all right, now I want you to, he's going to stutter, and you slap him in the back of the head. You know, it just, it all happens spontaneously most of the time. I don't think a lot of it was anything ever planned, and that's what made it so funny, because it wasn't overly thought. It was just an idea that this funny guy had at the moment, and we were all cracking up. And a lot of the time, you couldn't help but laugh before you do it or after you do it. You have those giggle moments, and then you have to do another take to kind of get it right. But it was just his um, his thinking and his funny little mind <laughs> to, <laughs> to make things go, you know, just a little quirky. And he would just see that moment of opportunity and just stick it in there, and it worked. I would say, apart from Fred being a phenomenal filmmaker, he's got a great sense of humor, and that really comes through in his films. Um, that just everybody's having a really good time on the sets. I I used to say that the, there's a certain there are only a certain amount of screen queen movies. People say that this is screen queen movie. This is, I used to say I only believed in my mind that there were maybe eight. I believed that there were eight movies that were made that actually fit this certain model. I think there was a model and the model ended at a certain time and only included. I, I think I thought it was eight, because I don't want to go down the list. <laughs> but um, it, was, it was what you said. There were movies that weren't really serious. There's tons of films where girls are crawling and screaming and begging for their lives, but that wasn't the kind of film I wanted to make. I didn't want to make that kind of film. Most of the films that, that I would make like this, the guys needed to look out for the girls. They were the dangerous ones, and they were funny. If you look at Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers, you know, people go, oh, blah, blah, blah. And I said, listen, there's, there is no sex in Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers. No one lives long enough. <laughs> no one lives long enough after meeting one of the hookers to actually, actually have sex. There is no sex in Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers. There's no, there's no sex in Beverly Hills Vamp. No one lives long enough to, to have sex. And there's not, in these films, they're, they're really, if you look at them, they're very harmless at that level. And when we did Bad Girls from Mars, um, we, we turned it in, and there you go. <laughs> we, turned, we turned the film in, and then when they went to release it, they had cut eight minutes of the movie out. And I went to the censor board, and I said, eight minutes? I said, why? I said, there's no sex in this film at all. I said, it's just some girls with their clothes off and stuff. I said, there's no sex. Why eight minutes? They said, it's just the sheer magnitude of girls with their clothes off, Fred. That's disturbing to us. <laughs> I said, this is, un this is unreal. But and I'll tell you this, that I'm from, uh, uh, from a very conservative family, and I moved to California. If you've ever been there, you walk down Hollywood Boulevard, and there are all these newspaper racks. And in these racks are all these newspapers with ads of girls that will come over to your house for dates. And I, my brother and I, we walked down and we looked at these, these newspapers, and I said, oh my God, look at this. And I said to my brother, I said, I said, who would ever let a girl like that come over to their house? You have no clue. She could be an axe-wielding maniac. And it's not like you're going to tell your neighbors, I'm having that girl come over to my house this afternoon. I said, you're not going to tell anybody. You're not going to tell anybody she's coming over. She comes over and saws your ass up with a chainsaw. You're going to know. And so when I, when I did that movie, it really was a morality play. And I stand by that. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a morality play about safe sex. Watch out. <laughs> Because she might be a chainsaw-wielding maniac. <laughs> and if you watch Beverly Hills Vamp, that's one more step, because that's what happens to them. Eddie Deason and his pals go to Hollywood, they find one of those sex newspapers, they call those girls, they go over to their house, and they turn out to all be vampires. 
And uh, it, was, it was the same story told twice because I didn't feel that you could get the message strongly <laughs> in the first film. <laughs> Uh, he's gonna look at his phone while well, he's up here. Oh my god. I'm videotaping him, videotaping him. No. No. <laughs> his phone's on his phone. How you doing? How you? He looks up once in a while and makes an answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ted, uh, yeah. same kind of question. Uh, the early days of B movies in the 80s, where we call them B movie genre films. Um, the mixture of sex and comedy and horror and sci-fi, it was unique to the time and it still is. There's, even though they try to do it today, uh, Showtime Late Night, Cinemax Late Night, the new movies, they're not, they don't have the charm or the longevity. The charm of the Deadly Spawn, I understand. The charm of the Deadly Spawn, or the longevity of the movies that they're talking about. Deadly Spawn movie. Yeah. Mm. What are your thoughts of those films <laughs> of that time period? Well, back in the day, I mean, you know, Fred will tell you, in the 80s, uh, when you did these films, you needed to have a little bit of sex, a little bit of nudity in there for the international market. And in Deadly Spawn, there was, there was nothing, so we had to just write a scene, and oh, we'll have the girl get up, and you can see through her top, and that was it. I mean, it was uh, the other girl at the end, when the, the monster comes in, and she yells, what the fuck was that? She was supposed to get her top ripped off by the monster, but at the last minute, her agent, which she never did a film before, comes in and says, oh, well, if she's gonna show her nipple, we have to get more money. <laughs> And I said, well, I'll tell you what, the monster will rip her shirt down right to the end of their nipple, and we're not going to show it, keep the same money, and that was it. So that was all the sex we had in Deadly Spawn. But, yeah, you needed to have that for international sales, and they told you, you better put it in there, it won't sell. The monster was naked. The monster was naked. <laughs> <laughs> As you remember what it looked like. What's, uh, for Fred, what's independent filmmaking like today? What the kind of movies you want to make? Is it harder the same well, you know in the in the 80s you could make almost anything and make money and i think i proved that <laughs> uh, you know it's like like bad girls from mars i mean like some i did i did an interview and i don't know why somebody wanted to talk just about that one movie the other day but it made me think about it and that was a, a movie that was so bizarre it was so strange it it, it, it passed all all senses of logic and and yet it, it did great and it's because there was a market for that sort of thing. And you could do almost anything. And I, I literally, at times, I would set out to prove that I could do anything and sell it. But you can't do that now. You know, back in the day, the, the VHS, that was all new. So anything right. that sold, every single uh, video store in the country had to buy it. It was in the catalog. So you made a film, you knew you were going to get X amount of sales right off the bat because they all, it was a brand new thing. Everyone said, oh my God, we can get these movies at home now? We don't have to wait for them to come on, on TV, circling the member in the TV guide? Oh, what's a wonderful life. It's not going to be on for the year. You wait for it and circle it. Now you can just buy it. So, so anything you made, like you said, would sell. Yeah, but it's different now. You, you, now you have to be extremely careful. You know, and you can make a movie for the same amount of money and now you'll spend a year or two trying to get that money back. The same money you spent in 1987, now you'll spend that same amount of money and you'll spend a long time trying to get it back or not get it back at all if you don't have a pre-sale in place. It's a, it's a, it's a different world right now. Yeah. And people, people, people come up to me and they'll go, are you ever gonna, when are you gonna make another film? And I say, I, I make three films a year. Yeah. I work all the time. I said, you're just not watching the right TV channel. Yeah. See, all I do now are lifetime women's thrillers <laughs> and Christmas movies for Lifetime and the Ion Channel. And I, that, that, that you would go from Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers to Christmas in Palm Springs. <laughs> and you know, and that's, 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 my, that's my life now. I make movies that women cry into their handkerchiefs over. And, uh, and I do it very well. I'm, I'm winning a lot of awards. <laughs> And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm doing them left and right. But I still do the occasional on my own. I did After Midnight, uh, which is on Netflix right now. It comes out on DVD in June with uh, Richard Grieco and Tawny Katane, which is a haunted strip bar. That's my kind of movie. And I had a very good time uh, directing that. You know, I could just sit there and direct that all day. And I, I thought it turned out very well. And I made it in five days for $60,000. And I defy anybody to make a movie that looks like After Midnight for that kind of money and that amount of time. I can't do that. 
So eventually, you know, when the whole crew just goes mute, you know, for every three minutes when a girl gets up there and starts dancing, because we had Christine Wynn and Erica Jordan and a bunch of other really fine young ladies <laughs> <laughs> performing. But you, know, you have to realize, too, that now anybody that has an iPhone uh, can make these movies in high def that look like film in 24p, can edit them on their computer, and it costs them next to them. You can make a movie for $500. And, there's thousands of them out there, and these kids, they don't care. If you're, you're gonna distribute my movie? You're gonna pay me? Maybe. They don't care, they don't care about it. So you can, when we made films back then, you'd have to shoot in 16 or 35, you had to invest in it, you had to spend money, you had to buy film stock, you had to print it, you had to develop it, you had to edit it, all in film. You had to transfer, there were negatives, there was music. Now they do this all on their computer and it costs them nothing. So you're flooded with this stuff. We had to actually make an investment in these films and, and spend the time to make them. So it's a totally different world now. Very hard market right now for low budget. But you can be, you can be clever. Uh, we did a movie with John Snyder and, uh, and Jimmy J.J. Walker called Super Shark. <laughs> and you laugh, ha ha. I made Super Shark in six days with $70,000 in cash and the rest in deferments, and I sold it as a Sci-Fi Channel original world premiere movie. And it sold all over the world. And it got two segments on the soup. You got a walking shark versus a walking army tank. And you got John Snyder saying, that's one big ass shark, and Jimmy, J.J. Walker saying, dynamite. <laughs> and they feed, they, feed, they feed the giant shark a giant ghetto blaster with C4 on it because the shark hates radio stations. <laughs> That's super shark. But you try that. that I, anybody else in this in the room, try making a movie in six days for 70 grand and selling it as a world premiere sci-fi channel movie. Just try it. It's almost impossible. But we did it. And I was afraid somebody would drown. So all I could think of was that the shark would come out of the water and walk around on the beach and that they would never have to go into the water. And my insurance, my insurance and premiums wouldn't have to go up. Oh my God. That's why the shark walks. The creative process. That's awesome. Hey, they did a sci fi did a thing called the 15 greatest shark attacks of all time. Super Shark was number five behind okay. Jaws, Jaws 2, or Jaws 3, or whatever. Where the shark came out and ate the queen of the beach, beauty pageant, and ate those beauty contestants. She was fighting it off with a beach umbrella. That only worked for a little while. What's your personal favorite role in these type of films? It doesn't have to be an old one, it can be a recent one. Uh, I always enjoyed Haunting Fear, which I don't think has come out on DVD yet. It's one of Fred's movies. Um, and I, I wanted to make a comment that recently there's been a sort of 80s revival and that Michelle Linnea and I have enjoyed a career resurgence where we did a documentary, which Fred is into, called Screaming in High Heels. And for... Um, no, no. For uh, Charlie Band, we did Trophy Heads. And uh, Dave Dakota, we did Cougar Cult and Three Screen Queens. So it was really weird, I mean, all these years later, that the three of us are brought together again. And we were so appreciative and so much enjoying being able to work together again <coughs> with this sort of 80s revival going on. And it was very, very special to us. We, just a lot of gratitude that people were still interested in us and that we could team up again. And it, we sort of realized that our power is the power of three. You know, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, that we are a trio, and that there isn't any competition between us. And it led to this sense of camaraderie between us that um, we just know we'll be friends for life but based on our movie roles. Um, we were on the set of the three Scream Queens and I walked up to Linnea and I said, Linnea, do you think we're going to be doing this when we're 70? She said, yes. I said, oh, okay. But Michelle, do you, do you have a favorite role or a role that was a favorite of yours? It, then or now? Honestly, when you ask me that question, I just get a flood of memories that run through my head. And all I can really say is that 
my favorite time, I can't say it was a favorite role or character, and I worked on movies with different filmmakers, you know, Ted and Charlie and everybody, but my favorite times and my favorite roles, I would say, plural, was when we were working and having fun, having a blast as a family, working together real hard with Fred <coughs> and Ted and the people that um, we did, we worked so hard for so many years, you just get on set and just have a blast. You know, and it was Brink and Linnea again or whoever else and it was just, uh, oh, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. We catch up on old times, get to work and, but those are my, to work. those are my best times. <laughs> Except the one time you yelled at me. <laughs> one time. We're filming and he, I'm standing, I think I'm off camera. Michelle, can you see me? Well, I could see you. <laughs> I said, well, I was told that if you can't see the camera, can't see you. Well, that's not true. Now get the hell out of my shot. <laughs> that was the only time he yelled. <laughs> Fred, deny, deny. <laughs> what was it like working with the, the ultimate independent filmmaker, Jess Franco? Oh, he was wonderful. <laughs> he was wonderful. What I liked most of all is because he knew what he wanted. <laughs> a lot of time you go on a low budget film and the filmmaker doesn't know what they want. They basically want you to direct yourself and you come in with, you know, uh, all these ideas and they just kind of leave you alone to wander around and you don't even know if you're doing a good job. You don't even know how this is going to turn out or what it looks like. He knew exactly what he wanted. He was very well um, thought out and everything was always ready. He was very professional. Um, and he, he spoke his mind and he was very upfront and he was very serious. And I, I liked that about him, that he just knew exactly what he wanted. He was fun to work with. He was a good guy. Um, so is the plan, the thing, does anyone have questions they would like to ask? Sir? Well, uh, this, this is for the whole panel. Um, Recently, uh, Fred was, uh, was mentioned on Sanguli on MTV. Uh, are, do any of you have any interest in uh, possibly uh, being out, interviewed on the show? I don't know. <laughs> if they asked me, I would probably. You know, I, I'm a big fan of that show. <laughs> no, I am. And, uh, we did a movie, don't laugh already, okay? We did a movie called Abner the Invisible Dog. And now, wait a minute. It had a great cast, it had David DeLuise, and we had Jane Keene, who was in The Honeymooners. She was Trixie. It was her last movie, she was, she was 90 some years old. And in the, mo in the movie, the, the thieves uh, grabbed the invisibility formula and they're in a toy store and they look to hide it somewhere. And I said, I, I got hold of Rich Cause, and I said, I want to make it this Fingouli Mad Lab chemistry set like you used to see in the back of the famous Monsters magazine. And he said, that'd be great. And he sent me photos of him and we created a prop chemistry set <laughs> with, with Fingouli's photograph on it and all the chemicals in it. And that's what they use in the movie. Yeah. And they hide the, the formula in there. And the kid, that's all the kid says, oh, Dad, I want the Fingouli Mad Lab chemistry set. So Rich, uh, when he was doing uh, uh, the Rondo Hatton uh, thing, because I had written that biography on Rondo Hatton, he contacted me and asked me for a copy of the article and could he scan some of my photographs. And uh, he was nice enough to uh, acknowledge me on his show for the contributions that I made. So I'm a big fan of the show. So I guess his answer would be yes. <laughs> I'm on the fence, Ted. <laughs> Any, anyone else? No questions? Oh, sorry. Um, uh, Fred, um, as a director in the early years, you had a, I guess, a habit for working with movie stars from our childhood. You worked with Robert McQuarrie, and then shortly before he died, you worked with Paul Nashie, our European wolfman. What, what, what was it like directing these two guys? Paul, Paul Nashie didn't speak any English at all beyond good morning, wow. and, uh, but his son did, 
and his wife uh, spoke some English. <clears throat> so we, uh, we did everything through an interpreter. And he learned his lines phonetically because he wanted to speak them in English and he didn't want to be dubbed. And so Michelle had a scene with him in English, which took a little bit of time to get through. But he was a very nice guy. He was really, he was a super fan. He was a super fan. And uh, he was there to do two movies. And the first movie that he was in, they put him up in a Holiday Inn Express on La Brea. And uh, his son called me and they were very depressed there. So I went down in a rainstorm and I picked them all up and I took them to the Hollywood Roosevelt. Oh. And I checked them in there and, and they were delighted. Oh. And I took them to Universal Studios in the Magic Castle and he was delighted. Oh. But he had a very bad knee and he couldn't get around much so I had a double for him in a lot of scenes. Uh, but he, I, I felt like we did the werewolf makeup probably better than uh, most of the Spanish films that he was in. But it was a great time. I just couldn't talk to him. You just couldn't speak to him. I had a little book called Just Enough Spanish. And uh, finally, I finally threw it. I threw the book away. I mean, on camera, I took the book and I threw it. So I just couldn't get to him. Bob Corey was a guy I met, and his name came in uh, during Cyclone. It was just an agent's list. There were no headshots. There was just a list of names on the paper. And I saw it, and it said Robert Corey. And I called him, I said, is that Robert Corey, Robert Corey? And I said, will he come in? And they said, yeah. I said, I want to meet him. So he came in, and as soon as he came in, the building caught on fire. <laughs> and I was with a guy named Dar Robinson, who was a stuntman killed on the very next movie that he was on. And I was with Dar Robinson when the alarm went off in the building, and we were right under Hal Wallace's office uh, uh, near the penthouse uh, at the end of Sunset. So we all had to take the stairwells, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this old guy's sitting out there, now he's got to walk down all these stairs. So we got down to the street level. Everybody's out on the street level. And I'm looking around, trying to figure out which one of these old guys is Robert Corey, and I see him. And I go up to him and I said, are you, are you Mr. Corey? He's turned around and goes, yes. I said, could I buy you a drink? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yes. And uh, he became a member of our family. And uh, we helped Bob and uh, kept close to Bob all the way until the day he died. So he would come, he would babysit my son. He would watch my house when I came to Chiller. And then eventually I brought him to Chiller. Uh, I brought him along with me one time, and uh, he was just a member of our family. Whenever we could put Bob in a movie, even if it was a voiceover, I think he voiced over the monster in Evil Tunes. Uh, we could put Bob to work any time we could. Oh. Oh. Uh, else? I want to ask about Biohazard. Personal cheese favorite of mine. Um, what was it like with uh, working with Angelique Pettigrew? Uh, Angelique Pettijohn, I saw in Mad Doctor of Blood Island. I guess she was in a Star Trek. And she was, she was uh, performing at the Body Shop, which is a strip club on Sunset. She, was doing, she wasn't stripping, she was doing burlesque comedy. So I wanted to make this movie, so I went there and I sent her a note on a cocktail napkin. And she came out and she sat down at my table and I made a deal with her to be in this movie uh, on a napkin. <laughs> and then I went to, uh, I went to a... a uh, a motel and I met Aldo Ray who lived in a motel and he'd uh, just gotten back on the wagon and you wouldn't know it but uh, I made a deal with Aldo Ray and uh, we, we made this movie she wore a platinum wig because I wanted her to look like she like her fans remembered her but she had dark hair and um, she, she had certain cancer problems and she died a year or two uh, after the film was made but she was she was great she was she was older then but, you know, I always liked that. I, got, I did a movie with Barbara Steele, and I did everything I could to make Barbara Steele look the way the fans remembered her, you know? I, I shot all of her clothes. I shot her all day long, and I couldn't find that magic lighting setup. You know, you look for that lighting setup that makes them look 20 years younger. And I shot, and I shot, and shot. Five o'clock in the afternoon, I saw the lighting setup that made Barbara Steele look right. And I went up to her, and I said, I wanted to shoot all of her close-ups over again for the whole day. But I said I would just line her up, and she could do it to this side of the camera, and this side of the camera, because I said, I found it. I found the lighting setup, and I did. I shot all of her close-ups over again so that she would look just the way I thought that fans would want to see her. So that's what we did with Angelique. Well, I asked about Angelique because the, um, the outtake that plays during the end credits is hilarious. That's her. And uh, I think a lot of people remember that. They might even remember that more than they remember the movie. You know, I don't know why those scenes aren't in the film, so I put them back in. I put those scenes, there's shots in the, there's shots of her, and I don't know why I would have ever cut 
her topless scenes out of the film. So I cut them back in. So the, the biohazard that's coming out on Blu-ray next month is a little longer than the original version. She was such a bizarre person because we were like Ed Wood. We shot part of the film and then the financers disappeared. So we would have these little screenings of what we had cut to, to show with potential investors to try to get the money to finish the movie. And her and this other girl named Carol Connors, who were friends, and would come down there. You know, it's just like, you know, Ed Wood and they're trying to raise money. And they would come down there and to meet the investors, right? Mm -hmm. And Angelique, the people were like filing out, and she just stood there one day and she said, you know, if Steven Spielberg was here right now, I'd drop down on my knees and give him a blowjob for all the great movies he's given Hollywood. <laughs> and all the people are filing out, and I said, you know, that's very astute. That's very astute, Angelique. <laughs> And it's like that was that was her. If she was the kind of person at the end of a take, she'd just grab your crotch or she she'd say, "What's going on in your pants, there, son?" You know? I mean, take that, forty-three. That was that was her. You know, that was her sense of humor. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that, that's talking about that. that's her. That's her. Uh, also, uh, Fred had written a book, The New Poverty Row: Independent Filmmakers and as Distributors. Uh, it's a really good book. A lot of people, it's like a Bible to some for independent film making. Is that still in print? It just came out softback. Okay. So it's gone, it's gone from hardback to softback. It's a great book. Uh, if you haven't read it or don't know about it, try to look it up. It's, it's really got great stories and about other filmmakers. Um, we have time for one more question. I'd just like to make a comment and say thank you very much for all the input into everything. And great minds always involved. Thank you. Aww. Thank you. 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 He's re-released Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers on Blu-ray DVD, and he has brought it to this show specifically for all you fine folks. He's selling it for $15. It has a beautiful insert design for um, Gunnar Linnea and I. It's a beautiful, beautiful shot, because he saw everybody getting gouged online. They're selling these this movie for unbelievable prices, so he thought he would do everybody a nice favor and bring that in for everyone to purchase. So come by. Just let me we'll finish out one thing here. Uh, over at our thing, uh, they say I don't push this hard enough, so I'm going to say it. I, obviously, I, I don't I don't charge to sign anything, but I do have a charity that I represent, and I made a special uh, poster, and it's it's not for sale, but it's for a donation of any amount. We don't look and see what anybody puts in there, but Michelle and I will sign that Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers poster on uh, on uh, on uh, this donation. It's just a tip jar. And that's what it is, and that's what I'm doing here. It gives me, everybody complains that I don't stay at the table, and I'm a wandering sort of person, but I, and I am. But it gives me a reason to uh, stay at the table, and it's um, a gallant few, and it's a uh, veterans charity, 